This is part two in the series Morality and Faith. Today I'm going to be discussing the dynamic nature of pragmatic truths with the purpose of helping us better understand what exactly morals are. In part one, I discussed and laid out the case that morals exist as pragmatic or functioning truths as opposed to concrete or material truths. And if you'd like to go back and become more familiar with that language, please go back and see part one. Today I'm going to be introducing two new concepts for you. And these are the concepts of primary expressions and mediums. Now it's very important for us to understand the difference between primary expressions and mediums if we're to understand the question and the answer of can you have morality without faith. So today as we discuss these two new concepts, I want us to imagine a picture. Imagine a painting. Imagine a piece of fine art from history, something which has transcended generations and inspired people all over the world. When you imagined this, what did you imagine? Did you imagine a blank canvas with some paint next to it? Or perhaps a piece of marble? Or maybe even some tools which might be used? It's unlikely that you imagine just the medium itself in its raw form. But when you imagine pictures, or you imagine paintings, or other forms of artwork, you often imagine the very idea of the art itself. You imagine that which is put upon the medium as opposed to the medium itself. And this is what the primary expression of things are. If you look at some things that are popular in our world, such as Starry Night, The Scream, or even something as, as common as the Mona Lisa, what is so significant and what is so worthwhile about these isn't the material that they were put upon. It wasn't the medium, but it was the primary expression. It was the primary expression which stimulates us and inspires us when we see it. So today with me, to further help articulate this, these, these two concepts, I have a painting which was donated to us here at Jolton Church of the Nazarene. Now, if we just were worried with the material truth, we would say, well, this is canvas and some paint. It quite literally is a piece of canvas that's been put in a frame with some paint on it. That's what the material truth of this is. However, if it were simply just some canvas with some paint on it, I probably wouldn't be so particular about keeping it around. However, the primary expression of this is something which is much more meaningful. The primary expression of this piece of, of canvas and paint is that it is the original building which belonged to Jolton Church of the Nazarene. This is what the people here originally had as a building. And that's what's so special about it. This painting was painted by the, the daughter of the first minister here, and it was handed down through the church, and it's now something which we sort of cherish. The value of this, the worth of it, and the significance is in the primary expression, not in the medium. And this is so important for us to understand. Because primary expressions and mediums are not something that only exist in art, but they exist in everything around us in the world. If we look at people's behavior, there are sometimes people seem to behave when it is merely the medium, as opposed to the primary expression, which are their intentions. A lot of times when we look to politicians, we look to people who may be their leaders, maybe they're people in a professional setting who put on a different facade than what they may have at their homes and with their personal lives. We can see that their tone, their temperament that they put out is different than their true character. Because their true character, their true intentions are the primary expressions. And the superficial tones and facades that people can put on are a medium. And as human beings, we tend to understand, even if we don't know how to articulate it, that there is a big difference between primary expressions and mediums. Within the church, oftentimes people will look to the New Testament, even people who are, who are professors and ministers and clergy of sorts, and they will say that we must touch the untouchables because Christ touched the untouchables. But the problem is, if we have some intellectual rigor as we come to this, the primary expressions of Christ's behavior throughout the New Testament wasn't that he touched the untouchables, but in fact, the primary expression was that he removed some seemingly immovable qualifier from people's lives. People had a problem in their life. Christ went to them and offered transformation, if they were willing to receive it, they had the problem removed. Now that's not to say that other problems may not crop up in life, but Christ's purpose was to come to a situation and bring orderly transformation. The primary expression of Christ in the New Testament was orderly transformation. The medium was touching the untouchables. And if you have the medium without the primary expression, 
you have nothing more than a canvas with some paint. You have something which is of almost little worth at all and is nothing more than a nihilistic object. So the thing is, is not everything's worth is in its material truth. Paintings, fine arts, its worth is not in its material truth, in other words, the medium, but the value of things and the significance of them is in their primary expression and what is conveyed by such. So a lot of times in our world, people will say, if you can't prove it, it isn't real. This is really the argument that only things have worth if their worth is found in material truth. Many people who are outside of the faith will present this and say, well, if you can't prove there is God, you can't prove, you know, insert theological argument here, then they'll say, well, it's not true. The problem with this is this is really a logical fallacy, and it's not one that most, I haven't ever actually met anyone in my entire life that actually believes this comprehensively across the spectrum of their, their life. With that said, a lot of times people do have incomplete maxims and incomplete ideas of the world around them, so that's perfectly common and it's perfectly functional. But the thing is, will it function in the broader sense of things? Is it bigger than simply our, our relative dispositions and is something fundamental enough to shape the world around us? Well, back to this argument that if you can't prove it, then it isn't real. This really is a logical fallacy. And a lot of times we, we hear this argument through the guise of reason and logic, when in fact it is very antagonistic to the very notion of what science is. It's very antagonistic to the idea of reason and logic itself, because if we can't disprove something, then we also, this means that it, it may not be proven, but it also means that we still have much to learn regarding the subject. And especially when we're dealing with pragmatic truths in the abstract world. When we're tampering with the, the platonic forms and the abstract forms which exist beyond our touch, it really is quite, I don't want to say it's quite lazy of us, but it's quite low caliber of us to quickly dismiss things under the guise that if we can't prove it, then it isn't real, because this really is a, a fallacy, because as human beings, we understand that there is value in pragmatic truths. There's value in names. No one can go out and materially prove that my name is is J. Dylan Proctor. You might be able to find some documents and things which can corroborate that, but if I were to pass away and thousands of years would pass, there would be no material truth anymore in my name. That would only exist as pragmatic truth and if some sort of you know, abstract evidence which could convey that idea was still lying around as some remnant. You know, oftentimes we rely on pragmatic truths in our lives even if we do not realize it. And something I would like to emphasize today is pragmatic truths are sincere and they have worth and they have value without our consent, without our confessing, or with even without our acknowledgement. So I'd like to restate that pragmatic truths do not need our consent, confession, or acknowledgement to be functioning. So a couple of examples of how we, we rely on things which are functioning without our, our true knowledge of them. You know, modern psychology has got us a long way and it's beautiful. It's wonderful things that we've, we've advanced in the medical field. However, we still don't know all the intricacies of everything. While we can do a brain scan, we can see that different parts of the mind are stimulated by different things. We don't exactly know how everything is working. We can see certain chemical reactions and things, but we're not yet to the point where we can read people's mind. But yet, we're perfectly fine with going around thinking. We're perfectly fine with going around and interacting with technology that we ourselves may not know the intricacies of. And even others around us have often discovered things by the experiment of trial and error. And when we learn things by trial and error, we're not learning them because of an absolute, we're learning them out of an experiment. And you know, in, in the world around us, it's actually quite rare that we prove things in an absolute form. Even when we learn things, even in the, the course of, of things that we have developed and things that we have, have built as a, as a species throughout time, we often make improvements on them. We'll often come out with a design, whether it be of something in the, the mechanical sense, or maybe even in the medical sense, we'll build something, and then a few years later we'll say, well, hey, we can improve it like this. We can make this more efficient this way or that way. Because we haven't actually constructed something in its absolute form yet. But it's in something that is functional, but it may need revision. So the notion that if you can't prove something, or if you can't know something in its absolute, then it's not real, is something that, uh, again, I've never met a person that actually behaves in such a way that is consistent with believing this, even though they may say it. And it's, it's something that really is, at the end of the day, antagonistic to logic and reason. Because as we understand, we really can't prove or disprove things in sort of the, the terms of pragmatic truths. We can see them, we can understand them, 
But pragmatic truths exist on a completely different scale and on a different com plane than do material truths. So while when we deal with material things in the world around us, it may say, well, if we want to have a good understanding with it so we can move forward, that is completely rational. And it's even rational to, to make the argument that if you can't prove it, it isn't real, because a lot of times people lack the discipline to deal with the unknown, and it takes a lot of discipline to deal with the unknown, which is what is required to, to pursue an understanding in the, the terms of pragmatic truths. So keep that in mind, that even if we cannot prove something, that is not the disproof of it. You know, I want people to keep an open mind as we, we deal with all of this. So back to the notion of primary expressions and mediums, it's really important to keep in mind all of this because even though we cannot always prove somebody's intentions, a lot of times it is very clear that the medium in which their behavior manifested was quite different from their intentions. And while we can't get a complete picture of people's intentions, a lot of times we can see that there's a stark difference between what they were thinking and how they were behaving. And that's something that is so important for us to understand. So there are two questions that I want to ask and then I'm going to conclude today's material. Are pragmatic truths primary expressions is the first question. And the second question is, are primary truths mediums? Because this is so important to understanding how morals are. Because if morals exist as mediums, then the question is, are they sincere as pragmatic truths? But if morals exist as primary expressions, then they are sincere as pragmatic truths. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the illustration of the painting. A lot of people may be familiar with Edward Monk's The Scream. They may not realize that it's actually something that he, he produced four copies of, this sort of four different renditions of The Scream. But we look at this and we're very inspired by it. But if we look at just the material truth of it, it is simply cardboard and crayons. Now I could bring in some cardboard and crayons here and I could create something which probably wouldn't be very stimulating at all. It would probably be quite, quite boring in fact and it would certainly not be considered fine art throughout the ages because the primary expression of it may not have the quality and the integrity that something such as the screen has. The primary expression of the screen is such a powerful and moving piece because the idea which it conveys is something which really stimulates the mind. But the medium itself is not very important in terms of its actual long-term worth. The medium may be important in whether or not the primary expression can be conveyed well, but the medium may have little to do with its, its long-term and absolute worth. If the primary expression is not there, then the medium itself may be cast to the side. So the legitimacy of things is not found in the medium, but legitimacy is found in, pri in primary expressions. So when we ask the question, are pragmatic truths primary expressions, we're asking the question, do morals and pragmatic truths, do they have sincere and legitimate worth as primary expressions? So morals are abstract ideas, and they function in reality as abstract ideas. They may manifest on different people and in different settings, but they don't always exist on the same medium. So it's really important for us to understand that morals and other abstract ideas are something which truly can exist in any sort of setting. So we know at this point that there is a connection between pragmatic truths, morals, and primary expressions because they can exist on different mediums. So let's go on to the second question then we will come back. So the second question is, are pragmatic truths mediums? And the, the answer to this question is yes and no. If we understand that specific pragmatic truths could be mediums, then we have a fracture in the logic. For instance, if we take morality and we say, we're going to make the argument of the utilitarian theory. In other words, people only behave a certain way because they want a desired result. This was the argument that the accuser is making in the book of Job. They look at Job and he says, Job is not actually an immoral person. He's only behaving as a just and blameless person so that he will get the rewards that you give him. This is the utilitarian theory at heart. People are only behaving a certain way because of the utility that that brings them. They behave a certain way, they get a desired result. The problem is, is that if we understand pragmatic truths to be sort of abstract forms, the, pla the platonic form of things, then we have a huge fracture if we view them as mediums. Everything starts to come 
apart at the seams if we understand pragmatic truths and morals in such a way that they can be utilities and that they can be mediums because they're no longer sincere. There's a fracture in the logic when we start saying people only behave morally for utility purposes. And while people may actually behave morally for a utility purpose, their intention is something different. If you're only behaving morally for a utility, then obviously your primary expression is what do I get out of this utility? In the example of Job, the argument was he was only being moral as a utility because he wanted the result of good rewards. So the primary expression in that argument is that Job wants good rewards. That's his motivation. That's what's causing him to go out and act in the world around him. And the thing is, if that is the case, then his behavior was only the medium that he was using to get what he wanted. The case that he was selfish actually starts to come together. However, is Job's behavior now the abstract form of what's going on? Is it the, the primary expression? Of course it's not. Is it the pragmatic truth of what was going on anymore? And the answer is no. So at the surface level, people can behave morally as a utility. And even things which seem to be pragmatic truths can be conveyed as mediums. But the problem is, is that they're not logically consistent. If we look at the holistic picture, the big picture, there's a fracture that comes up through things when we view morals as utility because they're no longer sincere. They're no longer actually what people are doing. Sim similar to like a politician or someone who, who is putting on a facade when they interact with others, it loses its sincerity. And oftentimes people can see through to that. But unmistakably, whenever these things are found out, it really cripples things because we see that it's illegitimate. So the utilitarian case of morality is very much akin to nihilism because there really is no inherent value in things if we only view morals as utility and as mediums. If morality is to be sincere, if it's going to actually be a pragmatic truth, then it not, cannot be a utility and it cannot be a medium. So here's the conclusion of today. Morals, if they are sincere or legitimate, can only exist as primary expressions. And this is because pragmatic truths, if they are actually what is going on, if the pragmatic truth, in other words, the moral behavior, is the primary expression of something, it cannot simply be a medium. It must be something more than a canvas and paint. It must be the actual image itself. It must actually be something such as the screen such as the, built, the, the picture of the, the church building that we have. So by using logic and reason and understanding the definitions of, of these different terms and what they are, we have concluded today that morals, if they are sincere, if they are to be legitimate and to have value, if morals are going to be to anything which can have meaning in creating a better world, then they must be primary expressions. Utility morals are nothing but mediums and therefore they cannot be pragmatic truths. And just again to repeat all of that together, morals can only exist as primary expressions because they are pragmatic truths. If they do not exist as primary expressions but as instead morals, then they lose their sincerity and a fracture comes and they no longer are anything but nihilism and nothingness. Morals must exist as pragmatic truths and as the primary expressions if they are to have any value. I hope you enjoyed today. If you enjoyed the material which I presented, please like the video, please subscribe it, and please share it and support our, our channel and all the things that we're doing. And I hope you have a good day.